Philippians, but you're looking last week at primarily the first five verses. We came to this verse that, I, that we read and we looked at a little bit, but I want to come back to it. Because especially today, we need comfort, but even more than comfort, I think that the body of Christ needs confidence. We need confidence. Confidence, not in ourselves and not in our ability to, to be good Christians or to stay in the faith or to, to make it all the way, but confidence in the Lord, confidence in the work that he began in us, knowing that he's going to complete it no matter what we go through. Because a lot of our friends, a lot of people that started with us are, are floundering and have floundered that have come back and some people haven't yet come back. And there are a lot of times people just are, are willing to just dismiss them and they say, well, they, they went out from us because it, to show that they were never of us. Or had they been of us, they never uh, would have left us and I guess that's not necessarily true. For whatever reasons, people do go through uh, deeply emotional things and circumstances that cause them to, to doubt and to uh, question God and to sometimes get angry at God and turn their backs on God, but God still lives in them. And I know that in the times where I've left the Lord, and I have, I've rebelled against the Lord and said, I've had enough of this, I've been burned by too many Christians, I don't trust anyone anymore, I don't think this is real, and I would try to walk away like that. Because everywhere I was, he was. <laughs> everywhere I'd go, he would be there. <coughs> And he would always still be talking to me, still reaching out to me, still just nudging me on to come back and, and trying to, to comfort me. But more than that, give me the confidence that he had started this work in me and that he was going to see it through all the way to the very end. And even the end is it wasn't the end. So Paul writes about this in Philippians 1, 6. He said, I'm confident in this very thing that he who has begun a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. We talked about confidence and how we have you can have confidence in something or a confidence in a person, and that confidence is only as strong as that which you put your confidence in. If you have confidence in a person and they have uh, disappointed you many times, then after a while you don't have confidence in them. But in the Lord, the Lord never leaves us in a position where we he actually fails us. There are times where he delays what he's going to do, but he never fails us. And after a while, when you walk in the Lord, you, you come to realize that even when you thought he was failing you, he wasn't. He was preparing something even better than you were asking for. And after many episodes like that, you just go, okay, I believe you, God. Even though it's hard for me in my humanity to believe once again, that you're going to come through, we know that he's going to come through, and he does come through, and so we have confidence. So Paul began his letter with a blessing, grace and peace to you from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. He was talking about, I thank God every time I think of you. I always pray for you, joyfully. I have done this from the first day you received Christ, first day that I ever met you. I took you into my heart, and I, I think that that's truly the heart of a real shepherd. There are a lot of people that are called pastors, but a true shepherd is someone who really loves you and may not even remember your name, but they still love you. And when you're around them, you know that they love you because they don't just treat you like you're, you're part of a, uh, a long line of people that they have to sign an autograph for. They, they love you with the love of God because the love of God is in them and the love of God comes through them and touches you through them. And you may have only one encounter with someone who is spirit-filled like this. And, and called to be a shepherd, or called to be a, um, an apostle, or someone who is um, a pastor. And you'll never forget that person, because Jesus came through that person and touched you in a way and ministered to you in a way that you'll never forget. And it, it becomes, a, becomes like a, um, a, a landmark inside your life, and you can always look back and go, I remember that. And that's what that, that what is what I think is the richest part of being in the ministry and being in the body of Christ. And if you happen to be a pastor, fine. If not, being in the body of Christ. Because what you, you end up doing, if you allow yourself to, is to actually merge in a, to a certain degree, to bond with the rest of the body of Christ, where you know the people. 
you, you feel what they feel, you know their heart, you weep with those who weep, and you mourn with those who mourn, and you rejoice with those who rejoice, and you, <coughs> you pray for them, and pray for the, their children, you watch their children grow up, and these things you can't replace. These are things that we'll, we'll never be able to do again. And then the Lord come back, and if you've been one who just were a mess in what you were doing, then you just never, you never got it. These, you you spun your wheels, you went through the motion, you pretended, you acted it out, you were hypocritical. God still let you into the kingdom of heaven, but he just goes, hey man, you just wasted a lot of time because I sent you so many people. I sent you so many people that I wanted you to love on them, and you just missed out on the blessing. Now, I don't think he'll even say that. I think he'll know it, and then you'll go home, and then God will wipe your tears away. But I think that there would be some sort of a, a sorrow involved when we go through some sort of a evaluation or a judgment. But Paul, I think, when he stands before the Lord, or as he as he has been with the Lord, and, and even is present with the Lord right now, he's one of those people that loved the brethren. He loved the people that he ministered to. And he loved them by uh, with action, praying for them, which is probably more than you could do for any individual. You might think that supporting them financially or being uh, with them and speaking to them is more important, but it's not true. Prayer, you're t- taking your time and your, your uh, precious fellowship with God to pray for another ind- individual and intercede for them is something that draws you very close to them and actually bond you to them to a, an extent where sometimes you can really be connected to them in a really supernatural way where you know when to pray for them just like you do sometimes with relatives. Like I know when my mom's in trouble, and I pray for my mom, I call my mom, and she says, I was just about to call you, and we're linked like that because of the bond of love. I, I think it's uh, the least of it is biological, and the, the, the greatest part of it is the love, the bond of love between us. And anyone I have a super close bond of love with, it seems like there, there's almost that success where you you know what the person is going through all the time, so you feel that you need to call them. You know, it's just like you get into that. So he says, I am confident of this very thing as I pray for you, as I think about you, as I remember you, as I, I pray for you with joy. I'm confident of this very thing that he who has begun a good work and you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. In other words, I think in some ways the comfort was for himself. He was he was comforted himself by leaving them behind but knowing that God would take care of them. That God would, it, it wasn't up to him to keep them in their faith. It wasn't up to him to keep them on fire. God would take care of them. He began to work in them and he would complete them. So the greatest concern a shepherd has for its, uh, has is for the welfare of his or her sheep, people that he ministered to, their health and well-being, their sustenance, protection and direction. And Paul being their shepherd, uh, over the church in, in Philippi understood their spiritual needs. They understood their spiritual needs, most of their emotional and, and mental needs, um, physical needs. He strove to protect them from heresy by teaching them the truth. And you'll notice that Paul didn't spend a lot of time talking about exactly what the heresy, uh, that, that heretical teachings contained. It was more that he was always showing them what the truth was showing them what Jesus really looked like. And that's what I think is probably the most effective way of keeping people from heresy, is to teach them so well about the Lord and about the Lord's heart and about what the Word says about the Lord. Because heresy can be anything. It's something that can even contain Scripture, and it oftentimes does. And it leads people away from the truth and into something that is a lie or a deception. But the only way that we know if it's a deception is if we know the truth. That's why the, the old uh, example of uh, people that work in the Treasury Department, they handle a lot of real money, so if they, if they ever touch something counterfeit, they know that it's counterfeit. Because there's so many good counterfeiters now, they even use the right paper, but you get an instinct for it. You get a feel of what real money is like. Same thing with the things of God. But he strove to protect them. He would always direct them toward a personal relationship with God through Christ. I, I talk about this a lot, and I, I always give uh, 
some time to this because I think it was one of the most important things I ever learned. And that is when I would go to my pastor, Chuck, <coughs> and ask him a question, he would answer my question with a question. And it wasn't because he was playing with my head. It, I would say, Chuck, this, that, the other thing, or whatever it is. And th these are the questions he would ask me, two questions. He would say, um, have you prayed about it? <laughs> and if you have prayed about it, what, what, have, what, what do you feel like God has shown you after you prayed? Second thing he would say is, what does the word of God say about it? What does it say in the Bible? They would always bring me back to prayer and going back to the Bible. And he wouldn't let me rest in him or take comfort in him or to rely on him. And because of that, the people that were discipled by Pastor Chuck became very strong. Strong in their faith. Either strong in their faith or they'd walk away from the faith. They became strong in their faith because he would not let you, let you lean on him. You know, it was like the uh, a lifeguard. He could come out and save you, but if you if you started to cling on him, we'd have to put you out. He'd knock you out so he could pull you to shore. So I'm I'm, I'm just indebted to uh, my pastor for that. But he would always have, ask that. Have you prayed about it? What did God show you? What does the Bible say about it? After a short while, I stopped talking to Chuck. I stopped asking him questions. I would just you know talk to him on a different level and just you know even have a type of light conversation with him because I knew that anything heavy, heavily spiritual, he would want me to go to the Lord for it instead of him. He wanted me to take everything directly to God. And this is what a true Christian shepherd does. He points you, or she points you, to the great shepherd. People that are shepherding people or leading people point you to the true shepherd. Paul loved those people in Philippi. As we saw last week, the church began with conversion to people incarcerated in prison. They were prisoners. First people that he reached were a bunch of ladies, not even men. Jewish women that were down by the river or down by the moving water. And then he was taken and incarcerated uh, in the dungeon. And while he was in the dungeon, you know, he's, he's uh, singing songs and praying and, and everyone was listening. And when God delivered everyone in the prison, gave them all their freedom. They all, in, in, instead of running away, they ran into the dungeon because that's where true freedom is. True freedom isn't, isn't physical. True freedom is when you're with God because when you're with God, you're truly free. He who the sense that's free is free indeed. So the jail and his family were also some of the first members of that church. And years later, Paul is in prison in Rome. He can't visit them. What will become of them? Are they, are they being cared for? Will they make it? Will they be ready at the Lord's return? Every time he thought of them, he prayed for them. And every time he prayed for them, joy would fill his heart. God would comfort him regarding them. And as he prayed, he received once again confidence from the great shepherd. God had begun the good work in them. Will he not finish what he has started? And these are just some of the most basic lessons that we learn as Christians is to learn to trust and rely on the Lord. No matter what we go through, no matter what our circumstances are, no matter what the impasse, no matter what the uh, obstruction, no matter what type of barrier uh, we're facing, or dilemma, or circumstance, you know that God is with you. He said, I'm going to, he told his disciples, we're going to go across the Sea of Galilee, and even while they were taking in water in the middle of the sea, and all the circumstances dictated that they would drown. They made it all the way across. They made it all the way across because the Lord was with them. And when he said, oh, you have little faith, why did you doubt? He said this because it wasn't that they doubted he couldn't do the miracle to stop the wind and the waves and, and save them. They doubted whether or not they were worthy. They doubted whether or not he cared enough about them. That's why they said, Lord, don't you care that we're perishing? And that always becomes the thing. Is we, we, knowing ourselves, think that God loves everybody else more than he loves us. And the reason why we feel that way is because we know our sin. We know the deepest, darkest things that we do. We know the ugly attitudes that we have. You know, the anger and the jealousy and the, and the bitterness and stuff that creeps up in all of us. We think, hey, I'm, I'm no good. Why should God do anything for me? The reason why God's not coming through right now is because I'm in sin. And, we, and Satan comes over and goes, oh, you're in worse trouble than you think. And he puts his foot on your back and you put down and you go. But God is saying, hey, I started this work in you. I've begun this work in you. You are my poema. 
You are my workmanship. I am going to complete that which I started in you. And when you think about that, and then you you take it for your own. You you own it. You take it. You realize that God began this work in you. He's going to complete it all the way. No matter what you think about yourself, no matter how weak or strong you are, you're going to make it because he is able. We can have confidence in him. So God had begun a good work in him, and he was going to finish it. Now I really understand why after he, did, <laughs> after he finished the creation, every step of the creation, he said it's good. He looked at it and said it is good. He looks at us and he goes, yeah, you're a work in progress, but it is good. <laughs> the fact that he has begun a good work in us is proof that he will finish that work. And this is having confidence. It's being persuaded of the thing. So when Paul says, I am confident in this very thing, he's essentially saying, I am persuaded, I trust, I depend upon, I have faith in, I hope in God's ability, God's willingness and desire to complete what he has begun in me or in you. So what is that, though, that God is going to complete in our lives? What is the ultimate thing that God wants to do in our lives? We know that it all began with faith in Christ and what he did for us on the cross. His personal sacrifice is what opened the door for us to, to the door of grace into our lives. And because of it, God's unmerited favors upon all who believe and receive it. And the question is, is, what does God really want to do with us now that we're here? You didn't earn it. You didn't deserve it. You simply simply received it by grace, and God saw that it was good. But what is the good work that he's doing in us? Is it for us to go out and be evangelists? Is it for us to be teachers? Is it, you know, I mean, is it all of the above? And I think that it really boils down to this. Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. I think that contains the whole, the whole banana. I really do. I think it contains it all. The good works, then, is work which God's grace is already doing in us. He's performing it in us and through us, which simply put is the transformation from the worldly to the heavenly, from the carnal to the to uh, godliness, to become a new creation in Him, one who is like His Father, one who is like Himself in love and purpose and in desire. That's what God is doing. All the other things, the evangelism, the teaching, the feeding the poor, all the good works and everything, come as a result of this relationship that God is seeking with us. Hebrews 13, 20 and 21. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus Christ from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, may he make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen. There you have the same thing again. Just a different word. That's what God's trying to do. He's trying to, without taking away our, our will and our ability to reason and be creative and be real and um, to be human creatures, he is, he is integrating his spirit with us to a place where we become a whole different person. We become a transformed individual. And he does this not by destroying what's already there, but by transforming what is already there. Sometimes I, I hear people that are saying, oh, just throw everything away, God. There's nothing good in me, and so throw it all away. But God doesn't do that. And you'll notice he never does that. He takes what is already there, and he transforms it into something beautiful. So if you're like a type A aggressive person, he takes that type A aggressive person, and he uses that person to motivate and to do great things for the kingdom of God. If someone is like kind of uh, aloof and sensitive and... and like a musician or an artist and they're laid back all the time. He uses those people to do something completely different. But these personalities and these characters and these idiosyncrasies are sanctified by God. They're set apart by God so that it makes a person someone who's usable by God and is well-pleasing to God as they are just simply themselves in a transformed state, in a renovated state. And so we emulate these people until 
that time when God says, okay, I think that you're doing a really good job emulating Chuck and emulating Wadi. Why don't you emulate me? Why don't you be like me? And the way to be like me is just to be yourself and let me work in you. Let me do something in you that is unique and different and, and you're going to really like what I do. You know, it's kind of like an interior decorator coming in and you're afraid to let go of your control over your environment, but that interior decorator can do a much better job than you. So I think that when we really look at what uh, Paul is talking about, God wants us to do this, this thing, looking into Jesus. So look unto Jesus. Keep our eyes upon Jesus. The lamp of the body being the eye. The eye being singly upon the Lord, so your whole body should be full of light. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy which was set before him endured the cross, knowing, and I'm just, I'm just interjecting this here, knowing that he was doing it for this purpose, so that he could die upon the cross, so that you and I could be set free. And then he could rise from the dead, enter into us by way of the Holy Spirit, and work along with us to transform us Hallelujah. into something that was glorious, that brings glory to God in every way. Looking unto Jesus, the author and finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and I would say even ignoring the shame, because Jesus didn't allow shame to stick on him. You know, people would shame him, they'd call him names, they spit on him, they did all these things, and it just kind of rolled off. You know, he wasn't afraid. He wasn't afraid to take the blame because he knew that he needed to. Because he needed to go through what we deserve. He needed the righteous indignation of the Father to be poured upon him and the weight of guilt and sin and the penalty of sin to be put upon him. That's what he lived for. That's what he was born into the world for. That's why every time Christmas rolls around, that's what I'm thinking about. I'm not thinking about Santa Claus and, and the integration of Jesus and Santa Claus, I'm thinking he came into the world for me. He was born in a manger for me. So that he could take away my sin and I could be with him. What greater love story is there than that? To know that God loves us in such a way. In such a, a great depth. He endured the cross, despising the shame, and now has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. So when you take hold of this concept, it will free you from religious bondage. It, it is not God's intention that you learn what righteousness is according to rules and regulations, according to the Mosaic Law, according to the Ten Commandments, and then go about trying to live them by your under and with the authority and the, the might of your own power and will, willfulness. What it is, is it's God's intention that you learn what righteousness is according to the Mosaic Law and realize that you are unable to live it. And then you throw your hands up and defeat and you say, I can't live this. I can't do this. I can't be good enough. And he goes, great, that's the beginning of wisdom. Now come and follow me. You accept the saving grace of Jesus Christ. And if you try to justify yourself according to the law, you negate the grace of God for your life. You negate it. It's not like God stops giving you grace. It's just that you no longer are appropriating it because you think you can do it. And a lot of Christians get stuck in this. And they fall away from God because they can't meet up to their own expectations of what they think they should be. You negate the grace of God for your life and are therefore bound by that law you're trying to live up to. Galatians 3.3, 3. Chuck used this scripture a lot before his death. And he used it at every conference I saw him at. He said, are you so foolish, having begun in the spirit, are you now being made perfect by the flesh? That was his message. Because a lot of the guys are starting to go, oh, this is the way we do it. Oh, we learned this from Willow Creek. Oh, we learned how to do church growth. Oh, we know if we do this uh, and we relate to the uh, culture that we're going to have more people in our church and then we can lead them to Christ. And Chuck is going, hey, I'm not going to tell you what to do, but have you begun in the spirit? Are we not going to complete it, could, uh, complete it in the flesh? If you look at the work that happened in, in Calvary Chapel, and I'm not looking back so that we can be nostalgic, I'm looking at the example of it. Chuck was a defeated man. If any man could have been really successful, it was Chuck. Good looking, highly intelligent, uh, wonderful speaking voice, and a uh, great Bible teacher. But he, he, he was not making it. And the, re the only reason why he wasn't making it was because 
God held him back. He held him back. He held success back because he knew that success would destroy the ministry that he wanted Chuck to do. And when he held the, the ministry back, Chuck was defeated and he threw his hands up and he said, okay, then I'm just gonna, gonna work for a living, I'm gonna go work in grocery stores, I'm just gonna do what little I can, I'm just gonna be open to the things of God, but I'm still gonna serve God, but I, you know, I'm, I'm a, I failed. And then what came from him? 1,500 churches and it's still growing. His, his voice and his teaching goes throughout the whole world, translated in all these different languages, because he stopped trying, because he stopped working, because he, he no longer was trying to rely on himself in any way, shape, or form. Galatians 5.4 says, You have been estranged from Christ, you who attempt to be justified by law. You have fallen from grace. To be estranged is to no longer be close or affectionate to a person. It gives the idea of having become a stranger to someone. Therefore, the Christian who walks in the grace of Christ rather than religious law relies on God to do the work within and is intimate with God. When you try to do it yourself, you're not intimate with God. You're estranged from God. Verse 7, just as it is right for me to think this of you all, because I had you in my heart, in as much as both in my chains and in the defense and confirmation of the gospel, you all are partakers with me of grace. The reason why he felt so strongly about their spiritual welfare was not out of duty or obligation. It was because of his love for them. He said, I have you in my heart. One time, Pedro who now is with the Lord, said to me, he said, a friend is someone that you hold in your heart. And I always remembered that. I thought, yes, that's exactly true. You can say that people are your friends. You can say that you love people. If you don't hold them in your heart, if they're not near to you, then they're really not your friends. They're not people that you really love. We say we love a lot, and we do to a certain extent, because just by the, the nature of the fact that God is love and God lives within us, we love. But if we truly love one another, we will prefer one another. If we truly love one another, we will prefer one another. But what does he mean by this? What is it to, to have or hold someone in your heart? We hear this expression in songs and poems and love letters. What does it really mean? Paul had illustrated some of it in verses 3 and 4 when he wrote, I thank my God upon every remembrance of you, always in every prayer of mine, making request for you all with joy. How many of you been in, have been in love romantically? Fall into love with someone. That person dominates your thoughts and your feelings. A moment rarely goes by without you considering how they are or where they are. The very thought of it brings a smile to your face. Makes you just kind of swoon. Okay, how about good friends? They surface often in your thoughts. Things remind you of them. You take pleasure in thinking about them, praying for them. I have friends like that. When I think about them, I smile. When I think about Richie Fure. I smile. And then I, I might write him a note. I go, Richie, I was just thinking about it today. I love you. Hope everything's going well in Broomfield, Colorado, you know. And he'll write back. You know, it's when you love someone, you hold them in your heart. You take pleasure in thinking about them, praying for them, getting together with them. And Paul's love for these disciples ran very deep. They were a part of his very soul. God places within the heart of shepherds a great love for those they minister to. The gospel of Christ came to Paul. Paul shared that gospel with those in Philippi. The wisdom and knowledge of God came to Paul. Paul in turn poured his revelation to his spiritual children. So parents are made to feed their offspring. And this spiritual interaction inter intertwines the hearts of those involved so that it's no wonder that Paul shared their burdens as they shared his. Paul was saying, I hold you in my heart as partners and participants of God's grace. Now, I know some people have abused this term now, and they use it to have people tithe. You know, come on, partners, let's do this together. And every time I hear that, I just go, oh, gosh, I wish they would have said that. Let's partner up here. You know. They should just say, just give us some money. We just want money. Yeah. You know, it is true that they are partnering up, but it's become like very passive in my eyes. You know, that. I hold you in my heart as partners and participants of God's grace whether I be a prisoner in chains or free to defend and confirm the gospel. And, and finally, he says, For God is my witness, how greatly I long for you all with the affection of Jesus Christ. He says, God is my witness. That is not the same thing as saying, I swear to God. It's 
something that we know that we should do. Yet, in effect, Paul was calling upon God as his witness to give <coughs> truth and weight to his words. These statements can be the most frightening truth or the most comforting truth that God himself is our witness, meaning that God sees everything. He's the one who sees and knows the truth concerning us and the things that we do and say. God testifies on our behalf, confirming the things that we say and do. Oftentimes, he will be the one that vindicates you when other people uh, have accused you or belittled your, your name. And this I pray that your love may abound still more and more knowledge and in all discernment. You have love now, but I will pray that you will have more. That it will abound, overflow, more and more in knowledge and all discernment. What's the relationship between love, knowledge, and discernment? I can answer this question with another question. How can one have godly knowledge or discernment without seeing it through God's love? How can anyone? And, and I will contest anyone on this. There's some people that probably think that I'm a heretic when I say things like that. Because they may see things differently. But I'll tell you, the only way that I know what is truly of God when I'm reading his word is to see it the way that he sees it through his eyes of love. Everything God does is for the purpose of love and, and compassion and the fruit of love. So how can one have godly knowledge or discernment without seeing it through God's love? Those who read the Bible and come away with knowledge or discernment, which is not of the Lord. You hear people with that all the time. They use the Bible to condemn people and to try to manipulate people and put people in line or scare people into staying in the Lord or coming to the Lord. But that's not the way our Lord does it. He never did things like that. Knowledge and discernment can only be seen clearly through God's character and personality, which is love. And I'll stand by that to the day I die. I, I've come to, to know this and, and believe in it. And every time I, I think about this, I see with God's eyes. I have the mind of Christ. And I see it in the light of that. That you may approve the things which are excellent. That you may be sincere and without offense till the day of Christ. The word approve means to try, examine, test, prove, scrutinize to see whether a thing is genuine or not. So put the excellent things of God to the test, meaning things that are important, vital, or of real value to spiritual growth. Be, that you may be untainted by the things of this world. Not, not being removed from the world, not trying to escape from the world, but being in the world, but, but having a hedge, a hedge of sanctification or holiness around your heart remaining pure, faultless, and blameless with hearts that are still sincere before God so that you may approach the day of Jesus Christ when he is revealed without having stumbled or causing others to stumble, but rather being filled with the fruits of righteousness which are by Jesus Christ to the glory and praise of God rather than being offensive and a bad reputation in the community, in the world, uh, or in the people around whom we work or... or uh, have to do would be filled with the fruits of righteousness. And that's easy if you're if you're bonded to Christ. It's very difficult if you're just going through the motion. Fruit is the indicator of the tree which bears it. That's the metaphor that we use. Fruit is the indicator of the tree which bears it. It is the visible testimony of a tree's health and the state of its being. So the fruit in our lives the way that we know if we're producing fruit is by seeing what we do, seeing what comes out of us, seeing what spills out of us if we get bumped up again. Let's pray, Lord. We just thank you, Lord, for your word. We pray that you continue to work deeply with us, that you would transform us by the renewing of our minds through your word. And we pray, Lord, that uh, as we continue to walk in you, that you would give us a vitality and a youthfulness, so to speak, energy that we need that is necessary to continue on, Lord, in this last chapter. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Amen.